Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam amma ba'd habati fillah continue on in our study of bulugh al-maram kitab al-jami' and we were in the bab tarhib min masawi al-akhlaq the comprehensive book the chapter of the uh, warning against wicked manners and we discussed on countless occasions or many occasions that Imam Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani uh, compiled in this bab in this chapter uh, those ahadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam which warn against uh, wicked behavior which is unbefitting of the mu'min. And the first hadith that we are about to uh, read is a hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam which is a stern warning against uh, backbiting and slander. Narrated Hudayfa radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, A qahtat or qahtat, a scandal monger, will not enter paradise. Mutafakun alayhi. So this is a very short narration of the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wa salam that you'll find in Bukhari and Muslim in the kitab. Uh, in Kitab al-Adab, in the chapter about what is disliked from Namima. And Namima, as we mentioned, is one of those sins of the tongue which is directly related, of course, to our manners. Because our manners, that is inclusive of how we speak, and it's inclusive of our actions and how we behave. And that the mu'min should always be illustrating righteous conduct. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us and you of our many sins and the wicked conduct that we, uh, the wicked ways in which we behave. I mean, ya Rabbil Alameen. And so from a, from uh, those uh, wicked uh behaviors that we must avoid is the behavior of as the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a qattat qattat and the qattat this is a namam this means this is a person who spreads namima and as we've talked about prior to this namima as the scholars mention that namima is spreading uh you know tales or information throughout the community with the intent of spreading wickedness. So it is spreading uh, maybe news about someone or spreading tales about someone. It could be lying about someone. And you do that in order to spread wickedness throughout the community. And this is a trait, unfortunately, many of us uh, have in the latter generations or more recent times, and perhaps even throughout, all throughout history, and this is why the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is warning against this trait, uh, many people have uh, embraced this wicked characteristic. And so, Namima, as we know from a hadith that we've studied and mentioned on countless occasions, is one of the reasons the person who is a qahtat or who is a uh who does namima who does this uh spreads wickedness throughout the community that this individual is a person who is mustahik uh for the punishment of the grave that means that they have right rightfully earned torment in the grave unless Allah Tabarakutala forgives them or they make toba from this sin and we know this from the hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, which is also a hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, 
uh, where the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam marra nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala qabarain faqal innahum illi yu'adhiban wa ma yu'adhiban fi kabir ama ahaduhuma fakana la yistatru min al-bu wa ma al-akhir fakana yimshi bin nabima the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said was walking by some graves, two graves and he said, إِنَّهُمْ لِي يُعَذِّبَانِ وَمَا يُعَذِّبَانِ فِي كَبِيرٍ He said, verily, they're being punished for the gra- uh, punished in the grave. And they're being punished for something that the people, uh, you know, don't believe it's, it's something major. And when we look at this, when we look at Namima and this sin that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is warning us against in this hadith, we see that it's so easy to fall into and it's so easy for people to embrace this sin, to listen, partake, and then spread it uh, throughout the community. So many, unfortunately, so many communities that even the people are supposed to be adherents of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah, but they have this wicked sin of spreading Namima. And people, when we look at contemporary society, Many people don't really have fulfilling lives. So they spend all of their time looking and being entertained by other people's lives. That's why reality shows are so popular and and on the YouTube and other things and vlogs, you know, video logs of how people, what they're eating, how they're dieting, how they do their makeup. People are involved in that. And so you see that people are always involved in other people's lives and then they're always willing often willing to spread wickedness from what they find in people's lives. So people are not fulfilled in their own lives, so they spend time investigating and going through other people's lives and spreading that wickedness around. Wallahu musta'an. So in this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, La yudkhulul jannah. So here he warned, and this is from the Bab al-Wa'id, this is uh, from the ways in which the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam are those texts which warn and give us the threat of punishment. And so the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, this person does not enter Jannah. قال لا يدخل الجنة لا يدخل الجنة قهتات The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the one who is this قهتات does not enter Jannah. They will not enter paradise. So here the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam negated. So we see that not only is this person from the other narration that we mentioned is mustahik for being tormented in the grave, but in fact, they will not even enter paradise according to this hadith of the messenger Alayhi Salatu Wasallam. And what the scholars of Ahl Sunnah when they look at these types of nasus, these type of texts, and that's what we need to know because we're looking at this from an ilm perspective and a perspective of giving da'wah and so forth. The scholars of Ahl Sunnah, they mention that this is from the Bab, uh, Bab al-Wa'id, meaning the threat of punishment, and that with that, that it is maybe not necessarily that the person will never enter Jannah, but that the Prophet ﷺ, and the reason being is because we have other texts from the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ to show that uh, that this does not mean that they will never enter paradise, but it's showing that it's a severe threat. And so many of the scholars also mentioned that when giving da'wah and mentioning these nasus, mentioning these types of texts, that... Uh, you sh- that uh, it's good to leave it in its asl, leave it in its in the form of the hadith. For example, narrating this hadith as it is, that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the one who is a qahtat or the one who spreads namima does not enter paradise, and leaving that. So as a th- as a to show the congregation or the people you're giving dawa that this is a very serious uh, sin and something that they need to avoid, and going back to what we were discussing, that this is from Masawi al-Akhlaq. This is from the wicked, sinful manners in which we have to do our best uh, to avoid. And that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam warned us that there is stern and severe uh, punishment uh, from that. And from some of the benefits that we gain from this hadith, one of the fawa'id 
is that the Sharia uh, that it is built upon uh, everything which is encouraging the believers to be brothers. And that's something that many of us forget. Many of the people, they forget that the asal is that the Muslims are brothers. You know, the Prophet Sallallahu said, a Muslim, a Muslim, you should do ba'da ba'da. The Muslim is a brother to the his brother Muslim. They strengthen one another. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, uh, the Prophet said, and be brothers, be brothers as believers in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam commanded us, and we know that the command, when it's in the imperative form, when it's in the command form, that it is wajib, it's an obligation, unless there's other nusuls to show us that it goes from being wajib to mustahab or otherwise. So, Therefore, we see that the asal in the shara is that we should be brothers to one another. And we mentioned that that brotherhood does need, is mashrut, you know, it is conditional in that it must be built upon the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uniting on Tawheed, uniting on the understanding of the classical scholars, the Salaf Asali, meaning the Sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala majma'een, the Tabi'een with Taba'a Tabi'een. How did they believe? What kind of manners did they ex exhibit? How, how did they uh, behave? And so on and so forth. Uh, the next, another benefit of this hadith is that this hadith shows that Namima is from the Kaba'ir. It's from the major sins, uh, as we mentioned, and there is a sh uh, wa'id shadid attached to this uh, sin. There is a severe punishment attached to this sin. And uh, when we have a sin that's mentioned by the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he mentions that there's a punishment attached to it, that is one of the criterion to let us know that that is a major sin and it distinguishes it from the minor sins. Uh, those are some of the main benefits of this hadith. In Alhamdulillah, Nahmadu Ta'ala wa Nasta'inu wa Nasta'ufiru wa Na'udhu Billah min shururi anfusina wa min sayyati a'malina min yahdi Allahu fuhu muhtad wa min yudlil falahadiya lah wa ashadu an la ilahi lallah wahdahu la sharika lah wa ashadu an muhammadin abduhu wa rasooluhu sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam amma ba'd Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hayyakum Allah jami'an. Continuing on our study of Kitab Ajami' in Balug al Maram. The Bab Tarheeb min Masawi al Akhlaq, the chapter or the book of uh, wicked mannerisms. And so this is a uh, those group of ahadith that Ibn Hajr, rahmatullahi alayh, uh, categorized or classified under the title or of those wicked mannerisms and characteristics that the Muslim should avoid and is warned against because they are characteristics of Ahlan Nar wa iyadan billah wa iyakum min al nar and we left off on hadith uh, 1302 Narrated Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Whoever restrained his anger, Allah will keep his punishment from him on the day of resurrection. A Tabarani reported it in Al Ausat. The aforesaid hadith has a shahid, meaning a supporting narration, in the hadith of Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, reported by Ibn Abi Dunya. In this narration uh, on the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam, <clears throat> and as was mentioned, the meaning of this hadith uh, is sound as it is in accordance with the other narrations that we've already studied in which the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam advised some of his companions as was asked to him 
who see me, you know, give me advice. And the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, said, La taghdab, do not become angry. So this hadith is in accordance with that and showing us that from the from the negative characteristics that the believer should avoid is being angry and being quick to become angry. And from this hadith of the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, one of the main fawaid or benefits that we gain from this hadith is this hadith encourages us to restrain our anger. That when something arises in which we are displeased with, in which seems uh, negative to us, or against our wishes and our whims and our commands, that we should refrain from jumping to become anger, angry. That we should try to restrain our anger, restrain ourselves, as Islam in general encourages us to be, uh, to restrain ourselves and to control ourselves at all times to the best of our ability. This hadith also shows us the importance of refraining from being severely anger, because usually uh, of expressing severe anger, because severe anger uh, often, as, a, as we mentioned prior to this, that this can have an effect upon things like people pronouncing uh, divorce or an effect on relationships, people cursing people, people uh, invoking the curses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on one another, or even uh, to the extent of leading to violence or encouraging violence from someone else when we don't control our, our tongues. And we know the many, many uh, sins from as is mentioned in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as well as from life experience uh, with regards to uh, becoming angry and allowing the tongue to precede our intellect and precede our ability to control ourselves. And so it's very important to uh, that a person is able to control his or her anger. In the next uh, hadith, the next narration, this is hadith uh, 1303, narrated uh, Abu Bakr as Siddiq, ta'ala anhu, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, A deceiver, a stingy person, and one who abuses those under his authority will not see paradise. Reported by a Tirmidhi who separated into two hadith and there is weakness in its chain of narrators. And so this uh, narration also is from those uh, weak narrations, but however, it does offer a important sound meaning and that is that a person should refrain from being deceptive and also refrain from oppression. And that's why Ibn Hajar listed this uh, hadith or categorized this hadith with those other group of ahadith which are uh, showing the stern warning and the threat of punishment for the one who falls into these characteristics. And the, and the two characteristics here that are mithmuma are first and foremost being deceptive and secondly being uh, oppressive to others you know being uh, abusive and likewise uh, the third characteristic mentioned there is being miserly and we know that the messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam sought refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from being miserly and that this is uh, a negative trait and characteristic and it goes against the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. In the next uh, hadith, narrated Ibn Abbas and radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, If anyone listened to the, peop to the talk of some people while they dislike him doing so, 
then molten lead will be poured into his ears on the day of resurrection. Uh, and this is a hadith uh, reported in Bukhari. In this hadith uh, of the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, this hadith is also from those negative characteristics, and that is having suspicion and spying on people or listening to those things which do not concern to you, uh, do not have any, uh, that you have no concern. It's not any of your business to involve yourself in what someone else is discussing. And so it must be pointed out that this is, of course, the one who is consciously listening to others, you know. And there are some individuals you'll find as if their ears, as if they're like uh, um, a bat or something, in which their ears become like a radar. When they hear someone, they, you know, come closer and they do whatever it is it it takes to be able to listen in on someone's conversation in order usually to spread evil usually there's only an evil result and we see from this hadith that just the act of doing this is something which is methmuma which is uh, disliked and uh, is something which is punishable as a punishable sin and any time that we have the threat of punishment um, in a narration or or with regards to an ayat of the Quran, that if the threat of punishment is mentioned, then that is one of the signs that that is one of the major sins. Because uh, when a threat of punishment, that is one of the characteristics, uh, when a threat of punishment is mentioned, one of the characteristics to show uh, to distinguish it from the minor sins is that there's a the uh, the threat of punishment is listed with that sin. Uh, this hadith from the fawaid or benefits of this hadith is first and foremost the tahrim and tastami'u ila qom Yakrahuna and Yasmahum Ahad. That this hadith shows the impermissibility that it is Muharram to intentionally try to listen to uh, people who do not wish you to uh, listen in on their conversation. So basically, eavesdropping. This hadith shows us that it is impermissible. To eavesdrop, and especially when it is something that the people do not wish you uh, wish for you to hear. And from amongst those characteristic, uh, uh, amongst those uh, various ways that this can take place, Ben Othaymin mentions uh, a great benefit, especially that is relevant in our um, in our day and age, and that is using the tape recorder or now using your phone or using some device in order to record conversations in which people uh, do, uh, do not want to be spread and do not want their conversations recorded and listened to. So now people use often, they spy on people and they eavesdrop, even if they are not there themselves at, at are present, that using a device in order to record someone's conversation secretly without them allowing for that to be the case, that this is a sinful characteristic. And we know so much facade that has spread due to this. And I can relate one anecdote of a situation in which one of our scholars was asked a question, and this is why some of the scholars, or many of the scholars, in fact, do not like you to record their conversations unless you've asked for permission, and especially if you're going to spread it. And a particular individual, he was recording the conversation of one of our scholars, uh, and he asked a, a strange question, and the sheikh gave him an answer, which was kind of a vague and general answer 
uh, which is understood in the context of all the uh, his other works, but it was easy to take his words out of context and use them against him. And this individual did exactly that. He took the conversation, he put it, um, he gave it to several other scholars, and then it became a feud of words to, to the extent of eventually, because of the stern warnings against the sheikh and the accusations and the attack on his character and the attack on his persons as a person being a, known as a person of knowledge and a person of the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a man from Ahlul Sunnah known for his vigilance in spreading uh, the uh, sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it went to court even. And it had uh, many repercussions around the world and affecting the sheikh's reputation and the reputation of those other scholars involved. And all of this began simply with the recording of a particular individual and then the sheikh's um, speech was taken out of context. So we see the danger and how this can be a, um, a type of uh, eavesdropping even if the person themselves are not directly involved. And I know we know many other situations very similar to that of certain uh, supposed students of knowledge recording scholars and baiting them literally to get to speak about other major scholars. Then that speech being spread and we know another particular scholar who was lashed because of this, who actually went to court and was actually lashed because of this, because of this type of baiting and eavesdropping and spying and setting up people. So we can see that the dangers of some of the technology, if it's used for Muharram, if it's used for wicked uh, uh, purposes. Uh, we also see from this uh, narration, one of the fa uh, fawaid, or one of the benefits of this uh, hadith is that the to listen to what people have to say to spy and eavesdrop to what they di dislike is from a, one of the major scholars and we already discussed why that is the case because there is a punishment which is attached to it. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is that, <clears throat> for example, if uh, a person uh, does listen and it is without the wicked intention. For example, Ben Othaymin, he gives an example in which a person listens to perhaps some students of knowledge and perhaps they're having a secret gathering or what have you, and this person is listening in on their conversation in order to benefit from it and not to spread the outcome and not to, uh, so that this conversation still remains under, that this does not fall into that. So it's very important, the intention, as the Messenger of Allah والسلام, said, in the ma'amalu biniyat, and also what you do with that information. Likewise, another important point is that the Messenger والسلام, in the Hadith, he mentioned, if anyone listened to the talk of some people while they dislike him doing so, so that another condition of this, uh, in order to be deserving of such a punishment and recompense, is that the person is listening to people who dislike for him to listen to them. So meaning, so they're e the person is eaves eavesdropping on someone and the person, those people do not wish for them to hear. So that is also another condition of that. And those are some of the main benefits of this hadith. In the next hadith, Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu narrated, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Tuba, a tree in paradise, will be for the one who is too occupied 
with his own defects to mention the defects of other people. Al-Bazar reported it with a Hassan, a good chain of narrators. In this hadith, the hadith of Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala in which he mentioned Tuba, a tree in paradise, being a part of the reward for those who were busy with their own their own defects instead of that of others. This is listed in this group of ahadith due to the fact that it is showing that it is madhmoon, it is sinful to do otherwise, meaning to busy yourself with the sins of other people. And we see in this time, and probably throughout time, but especially in this time, we see a lot of fitna, a lot of discord and problems and sins that are spread and enmity that is created for people busying themselves with the sins of others. And due to that, they often forsake and forget their own sins. And so this shows us that it is mithmum, and that's why it's listed under this group of ahadith, and it shows us that it's also important for us to busy ourselves with ourselves. And the examples are numerous in which we can find uh, that illustrate this point of the negative effects of busying ourselves with other people's sins. And this is why it's important that a person who busies themselves with the science or the uh, the science of refuting the ideology, the false ideologies, whether that be those external uh, ideologies and disbelief from Ahl Kufr and disbelief, or whether it be within the context of Islam, within the framework of Islam, that it's very important that a person possesses a degree of taqwa, that they fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and especially with regards to the issue at hand. So meaning that if someone is going to involve themselves with refuting false ideologies, for one, they need the knowledge uh, base to be able to do so. And this is why the scholars mention often that this is not for the lay persons. This is not for the average Muslim to involve themselves in debates and arguments and trying to refute uh, the people of innovation and desires, meaning the people of bid'ah and ahwa. Because uh, it requires a level of taqwa and it requires a level of knowledge. That means they have to have knowledge of the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which they are defending and which they are protecting from bid'ah, and they need to know the have knowledge of the ideology or the individuals and their mistakes with regards to bid'ah. They need to know why they are uh, innovating. What is what is the innovation itself? Because it's not possible to give something justice if you do not understand it and you do not uh, have proper and appropriate knowledge. So, for example, you find that there are many individuals that have the tarbiyah, that they have been raised in their Islam, not to seek knowledge, but rather to involve themselves in trying to defend the religion and refuting individuals and they do not possess the tools to do so. So you'll find individuals who perhaps know nothing of the Quran, know very little from the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, have not studied Islam at all, any of the other sciences, 
uh, are all the various sciences pertinent to the Quran and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but yet they can speak about individuals mainly from taqlid, mainly from blind following other individuals. So then they're busy with the sins and the faults and the mistakes and the errors and the bid'ah of other people, but they don't really know Islam and they're not focusing on themselves. Then there's another group of people that may know something about Islam or perhaps they may have some scholarship. Perhaps they may even have reached the level of being considered a scholar by many people. However, they busy themselves with the ayub or the sins of the people and the defects of so many other individuals and they're so willing to speak about other individuals that they forget themselves. That they forget themselves. Uh, do you, uh, you know, invite the people to the good? You know, invite the people to piety. And forget yourselves? Are you a person of intellect? So this is very important. That is a very stern warning from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fi kitab al kareem that we need to focus on ourselves. Do not forget yourselves. This is a warning to myself and my brothers and sisters because it's so easy to do. It's so easy to possess this negative characteristic. This is mithmuma. This is sinful. And in fact, can be one of the major sins. And perhaps can lead a person to the hellfire. Because it's a type of hypocrisy when they perhaps are commanding the people to good, forgetting themselves and indulging and knowingly indulging in negative and sinfulness, but quick to advise and admonish others. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us all of our many sins. Ameen, ya Rabbil Alameen. So it shows us that this is something mithmuma and that from the characteristics, the opposite of that, al-mafhum mukhalif, is that the opposite of this and what is inferred from this is that the one who busies himself with his own sins and his own defects is illustrating and possessing a righteous characteristic and, Ill, and exhibiting excellent conduct or the conduct which is befitting of the believer because they're busy with themselves. They're concentrating on their own shortcomings and it keeps their tongue safe because many of our sins result from speaking about others. That does not negate and this is very important that we understand this because many people, there's no uh, ifrat wala tafrit. You know, there's no going to one extreme or the other, you know, of leaving off the duty. It does not mean that those people who have the ability and have a level of taqwa, bi'idnillah, that they should not busy also or reserve some of their time for refuting and defending the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that must be done. And this is why some of the great imams like Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal and Kathir and Kathir from all the madahim, the a'imma, the a'imma to Ahl sunnah the imams of Ahl sunnah that they defended the deen. They defended it against bid'ah. They defended it against ahwa, desires. And they defended it against sinfulness. And they spoke about the people of sin and the people of desires and the people of uh, falsehood and false ideologies and bid'ah and innovators in the religion. This was this is part of the madhab of Ahl Sunnah, but it just means that everyone should not involve themselves in that science, and that 
that should not take precedence over looking at your own sins and faults. So that means a person who does that, they have a dual duty to be conscious and correcting themselves as well as protecting and preserving the religion because they have the knowledge and they have the azima, the determination, and they have the qudra, they have the ability. And they have, and part of that ability, and in line with that ability, is having the taqwa, fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So from this hadith, this hadith is, is, is immense, that we learn the importance of busying ourselves with ourselves and avoiding sinful and wicked speech and manneris, mannerisms. And from those wicked, from that wicked speech and mannerisms is speaking about others and looking at others' faults and making teftish and having suspicion and looking and searching for the faults of others. وَعِيَادًا بِاللَّهِ مِنْ ذَلِكَ In the next uh, hadith, hadith, the hadith of uh, 1307 or hadith 1306 the hadith of Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said whoever exalts himself and walks proudly Allah will be angry with him when he meets him on the day of resurrection Al-Hakam reported it and its narrators are reliable. So in this hadith, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has reported as uh, in Al-Hakam, uh, Imam Hakam reported it, or, or collected it, uh, the hadith of Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, that Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever exalts himself and walks proudly. So it shows us that from the characteristics, which are mazmumah, that Ibn Hajar is, is mentioning, and that's why he mentioned it in this chapter. From those uh, negative, wicked characteristics and conduct is to be proud, meaning to walk proud and arrogantly and boastful. To be boastful of yourself and to exhibit that in your walking. And we see so many individuals, and I'm thinking amongst especially non-Muslims that and of course you find this around the world Muslim and non-Muslim but I can think of certain individuals because they don't believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or they don't believe in Islam at least and they claim that they believe in Christianity and other faiths but you don't see any of that even exhibited in their conduct one particular individual I can see clearly in my mind who says he does it for his entertainment and to build his fan base he's a fighter and he walks with such arrogance, it's a kind of joke, but that type of arrogance and that pride and that boastfulness, the way he speaks about other individuals, the way he speaks and, is, and, and maintains himself in the public eye is so arrogant and boastful. And then Allah made, and Allah has checked him recently. He was humiliated and beaten by one of our Muslim brothers in uh, one of the combat sports. And the point being is that is a sinful trait and characteristic to be boastful of yourself and proud. And then we're talking about in arrogance. We're not saying that you're proud of your history or proud of your, the, uh, your accomplishments, you know, in a, in a positive light not being proud to where you believe you're above other people or you're prejudicial or you're arrogant or you're racist. No, but we're talking about maybe taking pride in your work that you've done, your research, whatever the case may be. But it's not something that you're exhibiting as um, in a negative light, as something is a form of arrogance. So we're distinguishing between a general pride and arrogance and a general form of pride and racism and other negative traits words are clearly mithmuma and go against the shara. And so from this hadith we see that those are some of the negative tra uh, traits is to be boastful and proud and arrogant and to exhibit that in one's even the way they walk. So we have to be careful in that we try to exhibit the humility that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us in every aspect of our life. 
from the benefits of this hadith is this hadith shows us the tahreem at ta'azzum fi nafs that it is impermissible it is muharram to exalt yourself to exalt yourself i'm so great i'm so good at this i'm so that you know, to, to build yourself up with pride and boastfulness. That this is something, uh, is the opposite of humility and the opposite of those good characteristics that are exhibited by the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, and in fact, has been clearly, as we see from this hadith, clearly, this hadith shows that that is a negative and harmful trait. Uh, and in... A sound hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet alayhi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man tawada lillah rafa'ahu. That whoever humiliates himself before Allah, Allah will raise him. Look at that. So ahla tawada, ahla, the people of humility and humbleness. And they humble themselves before Allah, not they humble themselves before their job and their, you know, so, you know, humble in the dunya sense. But they're humble for the sake of Allah, before Allah, in, in those things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with by being obedient to Allah. And they're humble and shy before their Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala, shy to do sin shy to be disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then this person who exhibits this type of, uh, these conduct, this conduct is one who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will raise. Bi'idni rabbina. Also the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam which affirms for us this meaning, the messenger alayhi salatu wa said, al-kibra batal al-haq nas. The Prophet والسلام, said, Al Kibr, you know, er, uh, you know, having this pride, this excessive arrogance, that this is, uh, he defined it, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that this is the one who, who maybe they know the truth, but they deliberately turn away from it. We're not just saying a person who's sinning, no, but they are arrogant in. Perhaps there's a, a debate about something, an issue related to the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or whatever the case may be. But their own arrogance and pride, they don't want to lose the argument, so they refuse the truth. They refute the truth in order to maintain their status. That this is a very dangerous trait in order to be raised up. They believe they're being raised in the in the sight of the people. But in fact, they're humiliating themselves because if they receive this little bit of praise in this dunya, in the hereafter, they'll pay for that arrogance. وَعِيَادَ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ ذَلِكَ Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us the impermissi impermissibility of walking in a way in which exhibits uh, this type of arrogance and pride. That we have to be careful uh, even in the way uh, that we walk and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves those who are humble and who are who don't act with this type of pride. In Allah la yuhibbu kullu mukhtalin fakhur. Allah does not love those those people who 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 are uh, who are prideful and boastful and arrogant. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us, it also illustrates for us that Yomul Qiyama, or that there will be a time, the day of resurrection, that uh, there will be, it affirms for us that there will be a meeting to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that, you know, you're, you're going to be uh, held accountable for what you did in this life, and you'll be called to account in front of your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also affirms for us uh, the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes angry and does not is not pleased with certain characteristics which are madhmum as we've mentioned madhmum shar'in in the next hadith hadith 1307 narrated 
Sahl ibn Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, haste is from shaitan. A Tirmidhi reported it and said it is Hassan. So in this hadith, the hadith of Sahl ibn Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said that the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam said Al-Ajala min shaitan Al-Ajala tu min shaitan Akhrajuhu At-Tirmidhi In this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam this hadith shows us that it is madhmuma to be you know in a rush to not give something uh, its due right that this is a characteristic Obviously, that is negative. How do we know it's negative? Because the Messenger of Allah said, is from the shaitan, anything from the shaitan. We don't share anything that we, that, you know, anything that comes from the shaitan is, is something uh, negative. That is the worst of creation to make taqlid of, to follow, is the shaitan. And so this hadith shows us that from those negative uh, characteristics uh, is to have ajala, is to be in a hurry. And an ajala, ahabatifillah, is in reference to being in a hurry to make a decision or do something without giving it any thought or any introspect, uh, in any you know consideration. So it shows us the importance of the opposite characteristic, and this is also implied from this. That we should not have ajila, we should not be in a hurry, but we should think about the things we're going to do. Not let the shaitan encourage us to rush into something. And the most classic example that I can think of, and I've seen the result of this in many cases, where people are in a hurry to marry. And doesn't and marry, this is a beautiful uh, uh, institution. Islam encourages us to, to marry. But often you'll find some of the youth, especially those youth who travel, and in fact, we'll just say that this is, we won't specify anyone because this happens to many of us. But a lot of times, especially if there's no families involved, and sometimes even when there is family, but there is just a hurry. When there's a lot of pressure to quickly marry, and not give things their rightful consideration by not analyzing and thinking about things. Thinking, hey, are we really compatible? Hey, uh, is this really the right thing to do? Hey, our goals are already clearly so far apart. Or I already see such and such aib, such and such thing that I'm that I find unacceptable or they find unacceptable about me. Is this really the right thing to do? So people often, they rush and jump, and I've seen countless marriages, and I can tell you about literal situations of people and individuals that I have known over the years, people who have divorced, married during the day, and divorced by the next morning. And this is not a strange thing. This is something we've seen countless occasions. People marrying quickly for various reasons, and, 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 and often, most of it goes back to Ajala. It goes back to just being in a hurry. And that doesn't mean that we shouldn't rush to get married if, if there's the khair and the signs are there. But it's just not giving it any ta'amma. Not even thinking about it. Not even reflecting. Not even looking and analyzing the situation to make sure that we are, we've given it its due right. So that way we can make a, an appropriate and right, uh, a, a blessed decision bi Allah. So this is very important. This hadith shows us, probably the main fa'idah from this hadith is that it's evidence that it is necessary for a person to, to really look into things regardless of whatever the affair is, whether it be involving yourself in the form of business or some other uh, transaction. And, and these are all transactions I'm referring to, whether it be the marriage, which is a type of transaction. 
a social contract, a, a, a contract between you, between the husband and the wife, or whether it be a business contract between uh, an individual to get involved in some something. Sometimes things sound too good to be true and we rush and then we lose. I know people who have rushed and then there's a baby and they divorce within a month. They divorce, you know, there's a pregnancy and then, there, you know, so this happens. We have to be cautious. We have to make some ta'amal. This is what the shara encourages us to do because the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, al-ajala min shaitan That al-ajala, that rushing and being in a hurry without thinking is from the shaitan. In the next hadith, narrated Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, a shu'um Misfortune is the result of bad character. Ahmed reported it, but there is weakness in its chain of narrations. Narration. Uh, what we understand from this hadith is that uh, having that a type of uh, wicked conduct is shu'um, you know, is this, um, this pessimism. So pessimism, and I think that might be a more appropriate for, uh, way of translating this term here, is it's a type of pessimism. And that this pessimism is, is from the negative characteristics. And all of these characteristics we have to be conscious of. And these are reminders for us of what of the conduct that we should have and what's befitting of a Muslim and the conduct, conduct we should avoid which is unbefitting of the believer. And from that uh, negative, those negative traits is having a negative outlook, being pessimistic about things, always being negative. And that this negative characteristics, as, uh, as far as the understanding of this narration, although it is a weak hadith, is that it is, this negativity is a result of, or a part of bad conduct. You know, it's a part of bad character. And so it's very important as we learn from this hadith in general, as far as its general meaning, is not to be so pessimistic and not to have negative conduct in general. It's a general warning, a stern warning, and this is what Ben Othaymin has uh, deduced from this hadith as a benefit that this hadith is a tahdir min suul khuluq. This is a warning against wicked conduct and we already talked about extensively wicked conduct that it can be in wicked in speech it can be in or outward behavior so there's many different ways that and many different characteristics which fall under that in the next hadith the hadith of uh, narrated abu darda radiallahu ta'ala allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said those accustomed to cursing will not uh will not be shufa'a intercessors nor shuhada, witnesses or martyrs on the day of resurrection, Muslim reported. So this is the authentic uh, hadith of the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam. And this uh, hadith is showing us that the negativity, that this is a negative trait to be of those people who curse others. And the Latin here, what is uh, what we're referring to, there's, uh, in English, we usually refer to cursing someone as, you know, saying a bad word to them, you know, and, and, and talk about the character. La'an is a bit different than that. That's a type of wicked speech towards someone uh, and damaging their character. However, la'an is referring to, basically, it's a type of almost du'a, that may Allah, when you la'in on someone, if you say la'natullah ala fulan, or la'natullah ala fulan, you are saying that may Allah remove the mercy from that person. 
So it shows us how severe that is. And that is, in general, something unbefitting of the believer to say that. It doesn't mean that there aren't times when it's permissible, but in general, the Muslim should refrain from it, and especially when it comes to another believer, that they should refrain from that. However, the scholars have mentioned that there are that it is permissible under certain times in order to uh, remove a greater harm uh, in, in maybe perhaps speaking and warning against a person of wicked, uh, um, wicked, wicked behavior or conduct or bid'ah. Okay, that doesn't mean you curse all of Ahl bid'ah. No, this is in, in a certain uh, reserve for a certain scenario. So what we see is here, the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, he said, Allah inayn, or Allah inayn. He said, this is the, the way in which he used this term in which he said, those accustomed to cursing. So this term that, uh, that we just mentioned, Allah inayn, this is a uh, Meaning the person who makes kathrat al li'an, or they make excessive cursing upon people. They're just quick. And what you find, unfortunately, in some of the Muslim nations, and I won't mention particular ones, which is very common, but you'll find from many ignorant people that you'll find, especially from taxi drivers, they're quick. Someone cuts them off, or they even make the mistake. And you hear them curse and invoke the curses of Allah on a person like nothing. And calling them a dog like nothing, and a himar, a donkey like nothing. And they don't even realize how severe those things are, those, those terms are, and how those sins are going to harm them. Likewise, you'll find many people who joke. You'll find many of the youth, Muslim youth, joking and lightly cursing each other for something small, or perhaps even cursing their teachers and others and people of authority with ease, like nothing. Wallah musta'an. And this shows us that this is a negative, sinful trait. And so from the fu'ayat of this hadith, from the benefits of this hadith, is it a stern warning about uh, being excessive in cursing people. Also, it shows that uh, cursing people uh, the one who does this uh, a lot and excessive, that this is from the major sins. Also from this hadith, we see the ithbat yom al the, uh, that this hadith uh, affirms for us that there is a day of judgment as is mentioned in the hadith. Likewise, this hadith is an affirmation of the shafa'ah and the various types of shafa'ah uh, that take place on the day of of uh, judgment. And those are some of the main uh, benefits uh, of this hadith. In the next hadith, uh, narrated Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever insults his brother due to a sin which he has committed will not die until he commits it himself. A Tirmidhi reported it and graded it as Hassan. Uh, while its chain is munqati, it has a broken chain, a tirmidhi graded it as, as uh, Hassan. Uh, in this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the hadith of Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu uh, this hadith shows us what we learn from this hadith is the that it is madhmuma, that it is sinful to uh, to uh, insult someone with regards to their sin. You know, bringing up their sin and insulting them regarding, you're just a zani, you're just this, you're just this, and perhaps it will return back to them and they may fall into that sin. You know, if this is uh, determined to be a sound uh, narration. But it shows us in general that we should not insult people in, related to their sins. In the next hadith, uh, a very important hadith, uh, hadith 1311, the hadith of, Bahzi bin Hakim on his father's authority that his grandfather sallallahu alayhi wasallam narrated Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam a say Woe to him who lies in his talk to make the people laugh woe to him woe to him a thalatha reported it and his chain of narrators is qawi in this hadith 
of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is a very important hadith because the topic of this hadith is uh, that a that the it, it is a stern warning against the seriousness of joking and making people uh, 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 you know, telling lies and jokes, and that this is a sinful characteristic. And we, many of us fall into that, if not most of us fall into this, and we have to remind one another, and this is why we're studying this hadith. And this hadith is a stern warning to be careful, because a lot of times you want to meet people laugh, so you not only exaggerate, we just tell plain lies. And what I also find, which is also even worse, because this is sinful in and of itself, enough, this is enough sin that a person attains. But then there are some people who make these kind of jokes and a lot of times there it is intertwined with the deen. So I won't say that they are necessarily ridiculing the deen, but sometimes they, you know, almost twist the ayat or come up with a new meaning in order to, you know, kind of make a joke or ridicule someone or ridicule something. So it's a very serious thing. And and perhaps a person can even leave Islam when they, uh, you know, when it comes to, of course, istehza or ridicule in the deen. So it shows us how important it is not to lie uh, just to make, just to have a, a nice and funny joke. So from this, uh, from the fawaid of this hadith, some of the benefits is this hadith is evidence that lying in order to make people laugh is muharram and it's one of the major sins. Also, this hadith, we gain from this hadith that it is a stern warning to not uh, make examples and make uh, things which are not even true in order to ridicule someone or in a, and associate it. Uh, to someone. So it's very serious and we've got to uh, do our best to avoid these type of uh, uh, traits. In the next uh, hadith uh, narrated in Anas radiallahu ta'anu, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the atonement of backbiting uh, a man is to ask Allah to forgive him. Al-Harith ibn Abu Usama reported it with a weak chain of narrators. This hadith is a uh, weak hadith. However, uh, it shows us that from this hadith, we also can see that if it were proven to be a sound hadith, that it illustrates that an expiation for backbiting someone is to seek forgiveness for them. And so we know we should, if backbiting is muharram, and that we should avoid this, and if someone falls into this and you feel a great shame and a shyness to approach that person, the least that you can do is seek forgiveness uh, uh, you know, for them. You know, meaning make istighfar on their behalf. You ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive them. And this is a way to perhaps uh, gain some forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what you, uh, for backbiting uh, an individual. Uh, in the next hadith, Narrated Aisha radiallahu ta'ala, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, The most detested of people to Allah is the obstinate, argumentative person, uh, Muslim reported. This is an important hadith, a sound hadith, and this hadith shows us the dangers of being obstinate, you know, being so firm on a position and argumentative, uh, you know, to where you refuse the haq. And we mentioned this characteristic before, that it's very important for a person to accept the truth wherever it comes from. Uh, what we learn from this hadith is that this hadith affirms for us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a wrath and is angry. And we know, uh, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, mentions all throughout the Quran and even in Surah Al-Fatiha, غَيْرَ مَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِينَ that, that there are people who have earned the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we should not emulate them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Kitab al-Kareem, قَبَرَ مَقْتًا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ and تَقُولُوا مَا لَا تَفَعْلُونَ That this is major, this is serious to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, showing it, it's serious and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is angered by the one who uh, says that which they did not do. So very important to practice what you preach. And 
uh, another benefit of this hadith is it shows us that that uh, wicked uh, deeds and wicked sins that they to follow it. They have different levels. That sins are not all the same, and some uh, earn a different type of punishment than others. And that we should beware all sin. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Anything I said that was correct was from Allah Azza wa Jalla. Anything I said that was incorrect was from myself and the Shaitan. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Nabi Muhammad.